17. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Sandra Reed. Uh, we will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Dance, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Uh, there are none. Uh, hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, the uh, agenda as presented is the agenda which we will follow. Uh, the next, or uh, the first item on our agenda is a selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight's public comment portion of the meeting. Dr. Ferrone? Two. Jennifer Horton? Uh, Hemchut Harry, Koss Schrader, Bye. John Hamill, Rhonda Bailey, Seven. Lily Rowe, Eight. Thor, Steve Prumo. Diana Bergman. Very good. Those are the 10 speakers who will be called upon shortly. Uh, it's now my pleasure to uh, ask uh, Sandra Reed, our Pledge of Allegiance leader and the principal of Pikesville High, to uh, come to the front of the room. And while I'm walking up, I'll ask Mr. Virch to make a motion on the resolution. I move that we recognize our principal of the year this August board in <laughs> 2017. I second. Is there a second? I second that. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. All right, this is our opportunity to uh, celebrate Ms. Reed. On we have a Board of Education resolution. Whereas Sandra Reed has served the cause of public education in Baltimore County with honor and distinction since 1995, and whereas Ms. Reed's personal integrity, consummate human relations skills, and boundless energy in pursuit of educational excellence inspire and enrich the students, teachers, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools. And whereas Ms. Reed has served Baltimore County Public Schools as a teacher, a mentor, an assistant principal, and a principal. And whereas, as principal of Pikesville High, Ms. Reed has united the school community through her call to action for Pikesville High as home of pride, honor, and success. And whereas Ms. Reed is a consummate professional who works diligently to ensure all children are educated in an environment that is challenging, supportive, and welcoming. And whereas, in honor of her leadership, Ms. Reed was named Baltimore County Secondary School Principal of the Year in 2016-17. Whereas, in honor of her work ethic, dedication to the students, belief, and success for all students, Ms. Reed was named 2018 Maryland High School Principal of the Year, and therefore, be it resolved, that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 21st day of March in the year 2017 expresses to Sandra Reed on behalf of the citizens of this county our deepest appreciation and gratitude for her service. And be it further resolved that the Board herewith extends its best wishes for her good health, happiness, and continued success. Thank you, sir. Here, here.
Good evening. I want to just take a moment to thank you so much for this recognition. Um, Baltimore County is the only county I've ever been fortunate to serve in. I feel honored, humbled, and deeply moved to be able to represent this fine county. I thank you for this acknowledgement. It means more to me than you know. Thank you for this recognition. Congratulations again, Ms. Reed. All right. Well, the next item on our agenda is a special order of business and magnet schools assistance programs, and for that I call on Ms. Johnson. Board members, at, the, at its last meeting, the Curriculum Committee reviewed and approved the resolution to be brought forward to the full board for your consideration. BCPS is seeking to, to apply for the Magnet School Assistant Program grant. This is the second M MSAP grant application. BCPS applied last spring but was not awarded the grant. If awarded in this grant cycle, BCPS could receive up to $3 million per, uh, per, five, per year for five years to extend our elementary, middle, and high school magnet program options. In keeping with the requirements of the grant application and the U.S. Department of Education, BCPS must present a resolution or a choice plan that identifies the schools that will benefit from the grant funds by providing a high quality choice option for families that will reduce minority isolation and promote socioeconomic status integration within those identified schools. Therefore, the Curriculum Committee brings forward for your approval the following schools to be included in the choice plan portion of the, the MSAP grant as a resolution for the application process. We have Woodmore Elementary School with an International Studies International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program. Windsor Mill Middle School with the International Studies International Baccalaureate Middle, Middle Years Program. Newtown, El Newtown High School with an International Studies International Baccalaureate Middle Years and Diploma Program. Middle River, school, Middle, Middle River Middle School with an International Studies International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program. Golden Ring Middle School with a Health Science Program and Overly High School with a Health Science Program. Additionally, these schools have been vetted for the school's capacity to draw students across the school attendance boundaries, current students' demographic, to, demographic enrollments, and to serve as our best option for creating new magnet options that will help us become competitive in the grant application process. Similar resolutions were approved in 1993, 2006, and 2016 by the Board of Education. Staff is here. Staff are here to re address any questions that the board might have. First, I'll ask if there's a motion to adopt the resolution for the Magna School Assistance Program. So moved. <laughs> motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, I remember in 2016 when uh, this uh, resolution came before us, and uh, I spoke in favor of it. The system was uh, just late in uh, filing it. And then it was reopened, uh, so you could file again uh, subsequently. And uh, I note that uh, Middle River Middle School is in our 6th District, as is Golden Ring Middle School. And Overly uh, High School, of course, is in our 6th District as well. I think these, uh, these schools will benefit tremendously, assuming these funds, which I believe total something like 15 million bucks, uh, come to uh, our Baltimore County. And it's all for the good. Very good. Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Um, can you describe what are the significant revisions? It spoke several times throughout the um, uh, resolution uh, to the magnet programs, and how are they changing what's in place now? Hi, good evening, Mrs. Miller. Uh, so, um, Mrs. Schubert will go through each of these programs, but most of them are new programs. Great. So, the Magnet Schools Assistance Program 
provide seed money for establishing either new magnet programs or significantly revising existing magnet programs. Five of the six schools uh, within the grant application would establish not only brand new magnet programs, but they would be brand new magnet schools within Baltimore County. Um, and then the school that would undergo a significant revision is Overly High School, which is currently one of our magnet high schools, but we would be looking at adding the health sciences program to an existing magnet high school. All right, any further questions? Mrs. Miller. How much will it cost us per year to implement the new programs? Uh, so as Mr. Virch indicated, this is a five-year grant for a total of up to $15 million. Uh, within our grant application, we are looking at pursuing close to that $15 million. Um, with any significant revisions, a lot of the cost will be in those upfront years, um, and that's costs associated with um, professional development for our teachers. If you're familiar with International Baccalaureate, a lot of that work is not only professional development for our teachers, but then taking those IB approaches and integrating that with our BCPS uh, curriculum. So it's not an even distribution across the five years, but we are looking at pursuing close to that total of $15 million. And in each of these cases, we worked with strategic planning to determine which would be the most appropriate locations to do this, and that was based on the facility as well as um, transportation as well. So you're saying that whatever we get is what we're going to spend. It's not going to cost us an additional amount to meet the requirements of the grant. We won't go over what we're getting. That is not the intent, no, ma'am. Any other questions? Mrs. Causey. Um, I just would like to understand how the uh, individual schools that are involved in this resolution, how were they reached out to in terms of agreeing with these magnet programs um, over potentially other choices. Um, so could you explain a little bit about that, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. First and foremost, um, as we've defined magnet programs within Baltimore <coughs> County, we had to have to ensure that the school has the ability to draw students across that boundary line. So we had to identify schools that do have room within their enrollment population to bring additional magnet students who aren't zoned for that area. So that's the first thing that we looked at. Um, within this grant requirement, as Ms. Johnson indicated, one of the grant requirements is reduction of minority group isolation as well as integration of socioeconomic status. So we certainly looked at the demographics not only of the six schools included in the grant, but their potential feeder schools as well to ensure that we um, met the grant requirements and have a competitive um, application. Um, and then we have been working with school staff um, and reaching out to um, close to a thousand parents have indicated their support for these programs at these schools as well as staff support. So we've engaged communities at all six schools to ensure that they understand the changes that are potentially happening within the school building. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? If not, I'll ask all those in favor to raise your hand and keep your hands raised so that Ms. Decker can take a roll. <coughs> all right. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Right. <laughs> our next item is public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this system, this is not the proper, proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. All right, remind everyone that inappropriate public, uh, personal comments are, um, are not welcome. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, uh, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see the time has expired. I'll now call on our advisory and stakeholder group um, members who have signed up. The first one is uh, from TABCO, and it's Glenn Gallant. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, uh, Vice Chairman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. 
My name is Glenn Galante. I am the new executive director for TAPCO. Uh, I'm here tonight on behalf of Abby Baton. She could not be here for, uh, because of a family commitment. It's her husband's birthday tonight. <laughs> he's a he's big Happy seven, birthday. seven zero, so she had to go out and celebrate that for him. Uh, Abby did want to start off with uh, addressing the board's uh, current heat policy, and she's asking uh, that before the board uh, were to sunset this policy that you would ask for input from the various stakeholders. We're all the concerns surrounding the policy. It's imperative that the board allow from the state, uh, to hear from the stakeholders to determine the best way forward. Uh, Abby's been sharing stories with you, uh, stories from the trenches uh, each time she speaks, and she'd like to share another one with you this evening. Um, and this is one from a high school regarding high school teachers and their workloads and what they have to do and, and the uh, amount of work that keeps being put on, on teachers. Um, and this is about in a space of a few weeks, besides the normal planning for lessons, uh, working with students on an individual basis, grading and reporting on students' work, uh, they also have to prepare SAT-style tests and vocabulary assignments beyond those lessons. These teachers are to provide students with SAT multiple meeting words each day to help prepare for the SAT test. Teachers are to print out drills and the SAT multiple meeting words every day and place them in a binder to prove to, prove, to provide evidence that, they're, that what they're doing. This is added to the regular curriculum, the work they have to do, all the data collection, the SLO data collection they have to do. And again, this, all these forms are put in graphs and displayed in different rooms. Uh, the thing about high school teachers, many of them travel from room to room, so they might have to display these graphs and uh, information in more than one classroom. And this is all being done without any extra time given to the staff to do that, increased workload. So it's a real concern. Uh, teachers are asked to manipulate the data in end grade so that someone else can look at the data and write the reports about the data. We have teachers spending so much time with the data and proving that they are teaching that they have no time to teach and work with their students in the best manner. Uh, you can't keep up this pace of what they have to do. Uh, since, when then, since when did data collection become the only way to prove a student is learning? Uh, we understand data is important, there's no question about that, but at what point does it become too much and when can we get back to what we really do, that is to teach students and teach them about the joy of learning. So thank you on behalf of Abby. Thank you, Mr. Glante. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County and that's Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Johnson, members of the board, and Dr. Dance. I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. At the February 21st Board of Education meeting, PTA Council testified regarding the findings of Johns Hopkins University's 2016-17 mid-year evaluation, Oop, sorry, which had been discussed at that month's Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting. The Hopkins presentation offered at that meeting noted slight upward trends in the percentage of students grades one to three meeting or exceeding growth ex expectations when comparing MAP scores pre and post stat. Dr. Ross of Hopkins asserted that these, these findings were not statistically significant. <coughs> at the March Curriculum and Instruction committee, committee meeting last week, BCPS disavowed Hopkins' findings, noting that Dr. Ross had misspoken when he stated there wasn't statistical significance. Even though Hopkins was contracted to be the independent evaluator of STAT, BCPS offered its own presentation with completely different figures. The presentation acknowledged that growth appeared to be small, but that it had been additive. It was concerning to hear committee members state that Hopkins' findings were incorrect and that they trusted BCPS's conclusions on stats, educational outcomes versus trusting what Johns Hopkins School of Education researchers had determined. An independent evaluation is essential. The board later this meeting in this meeting will vote on increasing the spending authority for the Hopkins stat evaluation from six hundred and fifty thousand to over seven hundred and eleven thousand dollars. Additionally, if BCPS has decided to gauge learning outcomes versus 
uh, via MAP versus PARC. MAP scores must be published for all schools so the community can determine where the schools stand in terms of achievement. PTA Council is also concerned about the decision to delete the heat closure policy. At the February Policy Review Committee meeting, BCPS proposed amending the policy to phase it out as more schools become air conditioned. Then at the March meeting, BCPS pros proposed deleting the policy altogether without public comment through the regular three meeting reader process. This policy offers objective criteria for determining when schools should be closed due to extreme heat. There are schools without air conditioning and many with partial or inoperable AC. The community worked for years to implement this policy until all BCPS classrooms are air conditioned and that's years away. Our students and teachers must be protected from unsafe conditions and this policy helps do just that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Our next speaker is from the Central Advi Area Advisory Council and that's Lily Rowe. Hi, so Amy, um, who's our president, had to leave, so she asked me to um, make this one request. The Central Advisory Committee would like you to clarify something. At the Policy Review Committee, I, my understanding is that the video constitutes the minutes for the meetings, and it appears, watching that video, that the motion was made and voted on and approved to send the heat closure policy to the board for a full vote tonight without doing three readers. And yet, in the agenda, there are dates for readers. And so the advisory council would like you to clarify what's going on. Because the agenda came out more recently than that meeting, and it, it appears that, is there going to be readers or not? Which is correct, the agenda or the video? I mean, you should know, you're the chair. Oh, so we'll, we'll follow the agenda and- The agenda is correct. Yeah, the agenda Okay, is correct. thank you. The next speaker is from the Northeast Area Advisory Council and that's Thor Trigveson. Both are correct. You can't assume how the board's gonna vote, so that's all they have to listen to. Good evening, board members. On behalf of the Northeast Educational Advisory Council, I would like to take this time to talk about the enrollment of elementary students in the Northeast area. The state-rated capacity for the elementary school system in the area is 9,759 students, but BCPS has found it just fine to stuff 11,322 students into the system. Let that sink in for a minute, 11,322 students. That's 1,563 students more than what the state says is acceptable. Projection for 2017 is to add more students to an already packed elementary school system and even more in 2018 and yet even more in 2019. And the addition goes on and on. Today, there is one, there's one elementary school in the Northeast area that is currently not above 100% of state rated capacity. There are currently four elementary schools above 130%. This fall, there will be six schools that are above 130% of state-rated capacity. A year and a half from now, there will be five, but don't celebrate because two more will be above 140%. In just three years, a school will break 150% of state-rated capacity. Where's the action plan from the board to tackle this issue? Granted, there are two schools being built. That is, if you qualify putting a sign on a piece of land as building a school. Each school is to be built with 700 seats, but quite frankly, that isn't enough. It will reduce the overcrowding, but still leave the system with more than 500 children over the state rated capacity. By 2021, you could actually fill a third 700 seat elementary school in the area. We have learned from bitter experience that the projections are conservative and these numbers are likely to be re revised up in the coming student population surveys. 
Where is the vision of BCPS for the area? Where is the short-term plan? Where is the long-term plan? Do you even have a plan? You have shown us nothing. It is time to wake up. Smell the coffee. Do your job. Thank you. Our next speaker from the Southeast Area Advisory Council is Jackie Brewster. Ms. Brewster. I have homework for you. And, 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 and don't get worried, that's not my testimony, it's not the whole thing. So I just want to explain a little bit about the packet um, because um, it, it is my testimony and then some exhibits that I'm going to, um, to talk about and then um, excerpts from um, testimony that I've done in the past. And, and just to understand, when, and I should say good, good evening, um, Mr. Chairman and um, Dr. Dance and members of the board. Um, this was originally written in response to a question from the Dundalk Eagle regarding the vote by the Board of Education on March the 7th. I am very upset with the Board of Education vote on March the 7th regarding limited reservations at uh, Dundalk, Lansdowne, Patapsco, Woodlawn High Schools. I'm also up very upset with comments given by board members, members including Ms. June Eaton, our representative. I have emailed both June Eaton and Ann Miller and asked them to meet with the principal at Patapsco, Mr. Reed, and tour the facility. The BCPS system-wide facil uh, physical facilities as uh, assessment um, dated December um, 2014 uh, report was created to look at every facility and rank them based on actual condition of the building. This report is available on the front page of the Baltimore County website in the left corner under report summaries. The report was created to determine which facilities should be addressed based on needs, not politics, or which parents were more vocal about their concerns. When you read the report, you will need to read each school profile, which I included the, the um, relevant high schools in there, since tables comparing buildings in the report are inaccurate. <coughs> Patapsco profile page rate rates it at 1.88, and the table shows 2.32. This is true of other schools as well. Let's use the report to look at which high school should be addressed next. Lansdowne High School with a um, score of 1.74, Patapsco 1.88, Towson 2.36, Woodlawn 2.38, Lock Raven 2.39, and Delaney at 2.45. Based on this report, the two high school facilities in the worst condition are Lansdowne and Patapsco. I agree that these two buildings would be very di difficult to correct all of their problems by a limited renovation. I do not know why it is even being considered, except for lack of money. I have spoke to Dr. Dance, the Board of Education, and Mr. Cabinets regarding the unique problems at Patapsico, and I've been told there is no money for a new facility, and that high schools are very expensive to be built. If I waited 10, 10 years, I could get a new um, Patapsico High School. This was Mr. Cabinets, not anyone from here. My response was that Patapsico was, has already been waiting. In 2009, Patapsco was supposed to begin its renovations. They even had a company come in and speak to each group about what we would like to see. I spoke on behalf of Patapsco as uh, PTSA at the time I was ending my term as PTSA president. Then we ran into hard economic times and then ran out of money. Our project was pushed back and pushed back again. It was pushed back so many times that the project no longer existed. Thank you, Ms. Brewster. And at the end of what my response is, it's not in here, is that I thank you for what you voted on for the contract because that, that at least us gets us started in the right direction, I mean, correcting the problem. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brewster. Uh, now, in public comment, our first speaker is Dr. Ferron. Good evening. I hope my sign is visible. Um, I really ask you, <laughs> I really ask you not to drop the heat policy. All right, students cannot perform when it's hot. 
sweating. If they have disability, it's worse. If they have epilepsy or tendency for epilepsy, it's worse. If they have asthma, it's worse. Um, it only makes sense to let it sunset if we have air conditioners in the school system. And since I'm talking to you about air conditioner, I really want to praise all of you for the past three or four meetings when you were really adding to the budget amounts of money for repairs, new schools, air conditioners. The one person I think really deserves special credit is Ms. Johnson, where last year, I remember really vividly, uh, I believe Ms. Johnson was the first one to make a courageous addendum to the budget last year of $10 million. And this proves that it takes only one person to be a leader in a change, and then everybody gets encouraged. Ms. Eaton spoke for the first time two or three meetings ago. Ms. Eaton, I want to encourage you to speak up and share your opinion and your positions and not really be quiet. If anybody really needs to be afraid of speaking is somebody like me, being visible, being Muslim American. And as you know, I talked to you about Muslim ban for 13 years. Actually, I really thank President Trump. He basically consolidated what I have been saying for a long time. Last but not really least, I want to ask you under the Public Information Act to send me the absenteeism numbers on March 8 and March 9th. Teachers, students, other employees. If you can do it in seven business days, I really appreciate that very much. And last thought about air conditioners. When this room is overcrowded, the president asks people to go out. But we allow schools to be overcrowded. We allow schools to be hot. And that's not really fair. If you sense out the policy, then there should be no air conditioners in administration buildings, including this Board of Education until next October. So basically, the board members and the administration would feel what the students are feeling. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Horton. Jennifer Horton. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Dance, and the members of the Board of Education. I am a member of a Towson community called Greenbrier, and this is a message that expresses a request from the Towson communities of Greenbrier and Fellowship Forest. The Greenbriers, uh, sorry, the communities of Greenbrier and Fellowship Forest, which represent over 330 homes, are unified in our request for an elementary school boundary study for the East Towson area. The driving force behind this effort is that our zoned elementary school Pleasant Plains Elementary is currently over capacity and will be for the projected future, which, put, which puts our children and their teachers at a serious disadvantage. The BCPS states that its, schools are, its goals are to keep communities together and provide the foundation for high levels of teaching, learning, and student engagement. These goals may be difficult, if not impossible, to achieve with the current and projected state of overcrowding at Pleasant Plains Elementary. The justification for the boundary study is as follows. Overcrowded classrooms put our children and their teachers at a serious disadvantage, leading to less individualized attention, lower standardized test scores, increased distractions, increased discipline issues, and overwhelmed teachers. Two, our neighborhoods should, should be distra dist sorry, districted with other Towson community schools not Lock Raven Village, which is separated from our neighborhoods by Goucher Boulevard, a major four-lane road. Three, our neighborhoods should not be divided into separate school districts. Greenbrier is currently divided into school dif two school different districts. Two school districts. <laughs> um, and four, the current underutilization of Hampton Elementary and Cromwell Valley Elementary, as well as a projected underutilization of Stonely Elementary, should be reevaluated along with other Towson Elementary schools given the findings of the 2016 student count report. 
for these reasons, we urge you to vote a boundary study for the East Towson Area Elementary Schools. We need your support and are hopeful that you will assist in our efforts to ensure that our children receive a well-rounded public ed school education and do not feel lost in the crowd. Thank you very much for your kind consideration and we look forward to a resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hemchon Harry. I got no title behind my name, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Good evening, distinguished guests, Hello. members, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hem Chan Harry, and uh, I'm a proud product of Kenwood Senior High. I'm a CPA and currently working on my MBA. Uh, I heard a lot of things here today, but uh, I want to thank, I, I want to express my gratitude. With all the challenges, especially with the, you know, the limited resources and budget constraints and everybody covering for everybody else, I know exactly what it's like. And you guys are doing one terrific job and you continue to uh, amaze me because you are preparing our kids for the future. I especially, especially like the, uh, the magnet program, the athletics in Baltimore County from top to bottom, all the clubs, you know, the chess club and all the, you know, all the fun stuff. And uh, also the second language program, Stroke of Genius. I wouldn't have thought of that in a million years. So I want to thank Dr. Dance for his leadership and all the Baltimore County's team members, especially the principals for these schools. I mean, they work, they work extremely hard. All that, but with all that, too bad for me because I am standing on the sideline. My kids has been on the waiting list three times over the last three years. With excellent score, by the way. So what I want to do real quick is give you a, a, a scenario. So I'm gonna talk winning teams. Like, like, for example, we all have Ravens fan here. Let's talk Ravens versus the BCPS, okay? Two teams. Now, if the Ravens want, they wanna score a lot of points because they wanna win. So what do they do? They go out and get good players, right? And the other day, yesterday, they got Brandon Carr from Dallas, beautiful. And then we have the BCPS team on this side. And for them to win, they want high standardized score tests. True, right? So here I am. I'm giving you a top-notch student, a wide receiver, my son, <laughs> to help you score a tremendous amount of points. This guy scored a 97 point on his magnet test the other day, and you all put him on the bench. He's on the sideline. My kid worked hard. His, he's disappointed, his heart is broken, and it's my fault. That's why I'm here, because it's my fault. I told him that if you work hard, son, you're gonna make it happen. And anyway, so I'm here today to ask you all to please reconsider my son's situation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our, next, our next speaker is Kaz Schrader. Uh, I'm Cass Schroeder. I'm, I attend Patapsco High School. You'll notice I'm very obviously underdressed for this. But um, fine. <laughs> I am here to talk about the additions for or the renovations for Patapsco. Uh, I'm in the arts program. It's my zone school, and I still go to the Magnet because I just love, you know, the arts. But it seems like when it comes to it, they usually get the short end of the stick. Like, and it's not just the arts, it's the whole school in terms of space and in terms of what we have. But there are some major problems. Like, for example, the art lockers in our art hallway 
are almost a fire hazard because of how much they clutter the halls. But there's no other area to put any other, you know, art storage space. And for our theater, we have two rooms, one of which isn't technically ours to use, and the other one is highly cramped because of, you know, how small it is of a space. And, I, like, all of this space is going to classrooms and temporary classrooms, which are temporary, but we've had them for years, and they're proposing to add even more temporary trailers for temporary classrooms and push teachers out of classrooms that are already too small for what they need to teach. And the magnet program is getting zero space added and zero classrooms, and it's not being handled very, very well. But if we had more space, if we had more room for space, then our school could be less overcrowded and it could be less uh, structured strangely and it would be a lot easier on the life of the student and uh, the life of the student that goes to the magnet for, you know, years to come. But without the space, it's really hard for any of us to have, you know, a good education in whatever magnet or whatever standard class we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Hamill. Good evening, Chairman Thank Gillis, you. Vice Chair Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board, Thank you for hearing my plea. I'm here with a colleague of mine from the Greenbrier neighborhood. You just heard from her, Jennifer Horton, just a few minutes ago. And I'm not going to reread her letter, but I will uh, hit a couple of the highlights and discuss briefly uh, Baltimore County Public Schools Rule 1280, the mechanism for calling for a school boundary uh, study, which is the reason that I'm appearing here. And the driving force is that our elementary school, Pleasant Plains Elementary, is very overcrowded. And some of the highlights of Jennifer's plea was that the justification for this uh, requested study is that it's well known that overcrowded classrooms do put our children and teachers at a serious disadvantage. And our neighborhoods should be uh, districted with other Towson communities and not commingled with other neighborhoods such as Lock Raven Village, which is uh, across from a major highway, Goucher Boulevard. And our neighborhood should not be divided up into two separate school districts, such as Greenbrier, which has two school districts for their children. And I hope that a boundary study will confirm that there is a underutilization of Hampton Elementary and Cromwell Valley nearby schools. And Stonely Elementary is projected to be underutilized in the near future. And that Pleasant Plains is projected to continue to be overcrowded. Now you all know, you're all familiar with Rule 1280, but I, I just have a couple of highlights about the superintendent who may call for a boundary study for, among other reasons, to maximize use of available space in schools. Now there's five or six other points there, but that's the one that stands out to me. Considerations that may guide the boundary school study include maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods. This is something that Greenbrier is facing and uh, we support uh, their concerns. Uh, another consideration that guides the study is efficient use of capacity in affected schools. It should be obvious with the four schools I've mentioned that some are more used than others and some are overcrowded. And also to consider the long-term enrollment and capacity trends and future capital plans. And then it goes on to guide the superintendent on who may serve, blah, blah, blah. And so I'll give you back 17 seconds. Thank you for, <laughs> for listening to my plea. Thank you, Mr. Hamill. Our next speaker is Rhonda Bailey. Ms. Bailey.
Rhonda Bailey. Good evening, my name is Rhonda Bailey and I'm a teacher at Lansdowne High School. When I was first offered a job at Lansdowne back in 2006, I asked if I could have a few minutes before accepting. Not being familiar with the Baltimore area, I wanted to get the scoop on LHS from a friend. She didn't know much but called her father, whose assessment was not the best but not the worst. After teaching at Lansdowne High School for almost 11 years now, I strongly disagree with this assessment. We are the best. We have a championship soccer team that represents four continents. We have a performing arts program that has a partnership with the Hippodrome Foundation, which allows for amazing collaborations between our students and professional artists. We have an award-winning FBLA program and a nationally recognized Project Lead the Way program. We have the most wonderful and supportive staff in the county that on a daily basis talk about the amazing things that are happening at our school. Emails are often sent touting various awards and recognitions, usually ending with proud to be a Viking. Unfortunately, that pride doesn't extend to the actual school structure. We're tired of an auditorium that floods and a track that's barely usable. We want a building and facilities that match the pride we feel in our hearts every day. In an ideal world, we want a new school. But if financially that's not an option, then we went the best upgrade this county has ever seen. Let us be the example of what happens when government and community work together. Give us a school and give us athletic facilities to match the pride we have every day at Lansdowne High School so we can all say that we're truly proud to be a Viking. Thank you. Bailey. Our next speaker is Lily Rowe. Ms. Rowe. So I have my sign too. Um, I find it impossible to totally understand why the Policy and Review Committee would spend a year deciding that the heat closure policy is paramount to the physical health and safety of children to then enter into a debate about whether physical health and safety when the, the heat index is 90 degrees before 11 a.m. outside is in any way comparable to sports and whether a teacher in an air-conditioned school gets to work when a teacher in a non-air-conditioned school gets to refrain from going to the hospital after school. In the hierarchy of balancing needs, I understand the importance of sports and it has always been within the superintendent's jurisdiction to decide if an outdoor sport can continue or not. And I don't know why when the policy was sent back to PRC to make some of those adjustments to allow for sports to continue when, or to allow the sports directors to make that decision as they already do anyway, how it came about that in the February meeting I saw some discussion happening and at the end of the meeting, I fully expected to hear more discussion in the next meeting. And when I watched the live stream for the next meeting, the administration came with a re recommendation to immediately delete without three readers. In other words, no public comment for the 3,000 some odd people in a Facebook group for, that started over the heat closure policy. So I don't understand how you go from the heat closure policy is paramount to physical health and safety of students and staff in situations where the outdoor temperatures make the indoor temperatures over 100 degree heat index to inequity because of sports and teachers who work in AC. So we should keep the heat closure policy and send it back to PRC to make the improvements that it was sent there to make. The other thing I'd like to say is he, I'm happy to hear about the overcrowding of Pleasant Plains being brought up and that they want a boundary study. And as the president of Greater Hillendale Community Association, I would love to say that Halstead could have an addition and we'd be happy to take our 157 students out of Pleasant Plains and put them at Halstead, which is a wonderful school. This would alleviate the overcrowding at 
Hill and Dale, and we could just really not include Stonely in the boundary study for that process at all. And I believe such a solution would make everyone happy. Our next speaker is Thor Trigveson. Good evening again, board members. I'd like to take the opportunity tonight to shed a light on BCPS Rule 1280, Chapter 2, Section B. State rated capacity, as defined by the State of Maryland, the maximum number of students who can reasonably accommodate it in a facility without significantly hampering delivery of given educational program. How can the board, without blinking an eye, tell me that this is not a problem to add 478 extra kids to a school and still abide by this rule? How can you assure me that you will not be significantly hampering delivery of a given educational program with overcrowding of that magnitude? How can you tell me with a straight face that the BCPS meets the state-determined student-to-classroom ratio with 30 to 40 kids in some classes? Dr. Dance, according to the same rule, you have the power to initiate a boundary study to achieve, among other things, to maximize available, available space in schools and align school feeder pattern. Why haven't you done anything so far? Why do we have to come here twice a month and nag, plead, and beg for your attention to our schools? You should be all over this issue, and you should have a solution in hand already. It doesn't take the whole board to decide on this. You can do it on your own. Dr. Dance, you have chosen a path of least effort, most comfort, while at the same time you have thrown us under the bus of overcrowding. Have you even taken the time out of your schedule to see the situation at Perry Hall Middle? You should spend a day there to understand the problem. Put yourself in our shoes. Most of us cannot afford fancy private schools. We are dependent on your ability to solve the problem. <coughs> I will gladly volunteer my kids to Pine Ridge instead of Perry Hall. There they will at least not be shoulder to shoulder with other students in the overcrowded hallways and classrooms and have no locker space. Dr. Dance, this, the situation is the product of your inability to seek change and your lack of courage to seek the necessary funding from the county to alleviate the overcrowding in the Northeast area. As a superintendent, you are responsible for the mess. It is time for you to do your job. You have to step up. You have to own the issue and you have to solve the overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle. Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve Prumo. Mr. Prumo. Well, it still fits. It does. Good evening, board. Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving me a few moments this evening. Uh, once again, Towson High School was built in 1949. It was insufficiently renovated 20 years ago. Its current enrollment is a little over 1,200, and that, I'm sorry, its capacity is 1,200. Its current enrollment is a little over 1,400, and it's on its way to over 1,700, which will approach 140% capacity when the school is over 70 years old, making Towson High School the oldest, most overcrowded high school in the county. Of the five schools that were rated the worst high school physical structures, according to your own assessment, Towson, as I understand it, is the only one that has not been given any attention in terms of possible renovation money or any planning. Before your last board meeting, as I understand it, a couple of the bo current board members and members of the county council got together beforehand and said, as a result of Delaney's request, maybe we should find some creative solutions and start putting some plans together for needed schools around the county. For example, Reisterstown Elementary, Perry Hall Middle, and Towson High School all deserve long-term strategic plans. We're all happy to wait for long-term productive solutions. 
And I just wanted to let you know that we encourage your collaboration on these issues to find creative solutions. Our kids really deserve it. Thank you. Our last speaker is Diana Bergman. Ms. Bergman. Greetings, everyone. In hopes to make history, I'm going to present a proposal that would stay with you for a lifetime, an opportunity to invest in a vision for the Southwest area. What I'm proposing has not been done in Baltimore County. And if we act upon it now, I'm sure somebody will. I have two simple goals. We need a new Lansdowne High School, and we need a fully funded community school program. OK? Yes, we definitely need them both. I will share the value, the opportunity, and the profitability on how together we accomplish these goals. Lansdowne Community will set an amazingly high standard for Baltimore County to introduce a new competitive approach to make BCPS climb to the top of the list of Maryland's 800 school. We can definitely make it to the top if we focus on, the, on this vision. The proposal is in order to get to the top, we need the support and investment of a major healthcare company in the industry. One of the largest and fastest growing career opportunity in the area is healthcare. I'm speaking to companies like John Hopkins Medical Institution, MedStar Health, University of Maryland Medical System. The reason I'm speaking to them as well is because all three leading businesses actively are sending a message to support communities to meet our health care needs. Well, Lansdowne has a need in seeking behavior health services, and we are seeking a new high school building to serve our community for the next 20 plus years that will support the growing population. Why not ask for the support and the investment of these companies to provide a percentage to fund a new building to meet the learning environment that will guarantee the training professionals they seek to hire? and serve our community health care needs. These companies rely on their community to support their jobs and are currently created at a rapid speed. We need behavioral health supports in our community to, e to be easily accessible. An off-campus site not only to serve Lansdowne, Baltimore Highlands, Riverview, Arbutus, Cadenceville, it has the potential of serving for me families like myself. I have a large percentage of military families that participate in the John Hopkins plan, and reaching providers in behavioral health servers is a long-awaiting process. We have the opportunity to reevaluate our magnet programs, even expand to area of healthcare management, when we also have companies like Kaiser Permanente, First Care, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and United Healthcare in our own backyards. The success of a wraparound community school program falls heavily, not only on the public education school district, but the business surrounding the community. Those serving the community grow for a better future. I'm not asking to raise taxes or create an impact tax. I'm asking for an investment that will benefit the company's growth and, and make a difference in truly supporting and leading our community's wealth, health, and future. I'm just a parent of three boys, a wife of an active duty soldier, and a voice for all children. All children given the proper tools can success, have saved lives, make a positive difference, and rise a legacy for all of us to continue moving forward. I set a very high standard for BCPS today, and all I'm asking you to request as leaders a proposal for these companies to make history with us. I hope you have inspired you today to begin a new journey to make Baltimore County schools competitive, earn an opportunity to be, have financial gain as a whole community, and transition into our diverse inclusive workforce. Thank you. Um, Thank you, I mean, I'm thinking out of the box, and I just want you guys to think. Um, we have an opportunity. Okay, 2016 February, that was the first community to ask for a new building. We didn't say give us more renovations. We said we want a new building. And after that, guess how many schools have followed asking for the same thing? Okay, we need to think outside of the box. We thank, need to ask thank you, Ms. Bergman. To help us and invest. Thank you very much. Our next item on our agenda is uh, item H, and it's personnel matters. And for that, I invite Dr. Mayo. Good evening. Retirements and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in H1 and H2? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Dr. Dance, next is administrative appointments. Chairman Gillis and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Supervisor of Health Services in the Office of Student Support Services, Pupil Personnel Worker in the Office of Student Support Services, and Human Resources Officer in the Department of HR. 
Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in I-1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Dr. Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, would like to introduce three members of our team who are being promoted. First, for the supervisor of health services, currently right now a school nurse at Pine Grove Elementary School, that's Ms. Eileen Ertel. Eileen, congratulations to you. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I do. My husband, John, and Marilyn Neely. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> Next is for pupil personnel worker, currently right now school counselor at Lyons Mill Elementary School. That's Mr. Howard Franklin. <laughs> Howard, do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Everyone stand up so we can recognize you. Congratulations to you. Clark has a big smile on her face, so congratulations to all of you. Last but not least, human resources officer in the Department of HR, currently right now an assistant principal at Western School of Technology and Environmental Science. Congratulations, Tiffany Harris. And Tiffany, do you have any family or friends with you here tonight? Congratulations. Mr. Chair, that concludes the administrative appointments. Congratulations to each of you and your promotions. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Uh, next on our agenda is item J, contract awards. And for that, I call our contracts committee chair, um, Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis, members of the board. The board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. And items J1 through J25 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve items J1 through J25? So moved. Uh, no seconds needed since uh, the recommendation comes from a committee. Any discussion? Mrs. Miller. Yeah, I, I just had some questions about number 20 and 25. How about if we then pull, segregate 20 and 25? Um, then I'll ask is uh, for a vote on items J1 through 19. Uh, as well as 21 through 24. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 As Mr. Those, Gil, I'd like to abstain from J7. Please note that Mr. McDaniels has abstained from 7. I will now go to J20, Mrs. Miller. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had a couple questions on this. It's on the non-public placements and the, the expense of that. Um, I, I understand from the Buildings and Contracts Committee discussion that we're spending $20 million from our own budget per year for non-public placements. Is that right? About uh, approximately I'm sorry, $40 million. $22 million from our budget and approximately 18 from the state of Maryland at, for based on our current year estimates. Okay. Um, so that comes to about 70000 per student per year, roughly? That's about right. It's quite a bit. Um, can you tell, tell us a little bit more about how or what determines when a student is placed in non-public placement? Is it that no, we're... Dr. Witt said. <laughs> Your question was related to um, the referral process. It's an IEP team decision, um, and through that decision, once all the options and services are exhausted within the public school system is when it is made as a referral to a possible non-public school. Okay, so I'm wondering, is it typically that we are just incapable of meeting the needs of that student, or is it partly 
how much we are putting into not maybe not inclusion classrooms or other special ed services could it be that we could reduce that number by putting more into specific special ed services so um, a, a couple of different things happen you're correct that there are inclusion services there are self-contained classrooms there's also special education schools so those are all the placements we consider before the non-public school there are still uh, a number of students a small number compared to our total population that require services that are more extensive than what can be provided there we're talking about students that maybe need like a clinic type model or possibly two on one instruction something more severe than what we can offer even in our public separate day schools. And how would you break down about how many is it where we could absolutely not meet their needs versus ones where we've just exhausted going through the process? So um, like for this school year, we have, and this carries over from year to year, we're serving about 574 students in non-public placements this year. The referrals that were made this year were about um, somewhere around 50 referrals were made this year. Now that could be students that moved into the county who it was already on their IEP, so um, we had no choice but to make continue that placement. We always look at that in the IEP team to see if uh, perhaps there could be a service that we could provide or could we contract non-public services still to be used within our public schools. That's another way that the monies are spent. Okay, I just wanted to understand that process better and mm -hmm. I've heard a lot from um, parents and teachers about um, the um, self-contained mm -hmm. classrooms really kind of going away, so there's a lot more um, integrated classrooms, and that has me concerned. Well, uh, there still are many self-contained classrooms. We have um, them in comprehensive or neighborhood schools. They're not in every school, nor have they been in every school. We call them regional programs, so we are, uh, can transport students from like uh, an area to one particular school if the child has that particular need that needs the self-contained program. So we do still have self-contained classrooms within comprehensive schools, and then we have self-contained or special schools. Okay, thank you. Good. Any other questions about J20? Mrs. Question. Johnson. I just want to make a comment. Um, thank you for bringing this to us. I had, I actually was, my daughter is in middle school and she, her um, chorus went to Kennedy Krieger to sing. And they started that tradition because they had a student um, who attended from Pikesville Middle who attended Kennedy Krieger after a um, severe brain injury. And so every Christmas they go there and they sing for, this, for the students there. So um, th she was able to continue her education through Kennedy Krieger. And as far as integration goes, um, I, am, I was at Delaney High School. I remember a young Muslim boy who was in one of my classes who was my partner and he was integrated into our classes. So um, we are actually still friends to this day. So I, I like that, that program too. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about J20? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that motion carries. Uh, and the last item is J25, Mrs. Miller. Yes, I wanted to ask when we will have the mid-year evaluation on stat presented to the full board so that all of the members can ask questions. Um, stat. I don't have the release date for that report, but perhaps Dr. Brown or somebody else might. I, I'm talking about the mid-year that was already given to the curriculum committee. So mid-year reports for STAT and World Languages presented to the curriculum committee. In July of every year, we present the end of the year for STAT, and in August is the end of the year for the World Language Acquisition Program. Uh, I, I think that's, um, well, that, that prevents the full board from being able to ask 
questions of the evaluators. Um, and I know that that's something that we always try to avoid is to having information going out to only part of the board. So uh, I would ask that that evaluation be presented to the full board in the public so that we can all ask questions and have some give and take between the evaluators and members. Any other questions or comments about J25? All right, then all in favor of J25, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good, J25 carries as well. Mrs. Causey? I just wanted to make a comment that um, earlier at the Building and Contracts Committee meeting, there was um, a lot of discussion around um, many of these contracts and that those meetings are now um, live streamed and archived under the, bill, um, the board committee uh, tab on the website. So if folks want to go back and learn more about questions and uh, information that was given by staff, uh, there was a lot of good discussion there. Very good, thank you. Yeah, uh, next. Could I just add that I agree with that. However, it, uh, having it only presented at the committee meetings pre prevents all of the members to ask those questions. Very good, thanks. Next item on our agenda is item K, and that's a report on policies, and for that I call on the Policy Review Committee Chair, Mrs. Williams. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chairwoman, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Dance, and fellow board members. The Policy Review Committee uh, has reviewed the policies presented to you for first reader on tonight's board agenda's Exhibit K. Uh, the committee is recommending that policies 1270, 5550, 5560, and 6602 be moved forward for a second reader. Uh, and as everyone is aware that there is opportunity for um, presentation of any um, additional uh, comments with regard to these policies. Uh, however, staff is available should board members have any questions about these policies tonight. Very good. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? No move. And no seconds required. Um, discussion? Mrs. Causey. Madam uh, Chair of the Policy Review Committee, uh, could you clarify which policies you're moving forward to second reader? 1270, 5550, 5560, and 6602. Thank you. All right, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Mrs. Williams. I, I'd Thank like you. to register a no on. Uh, I, I didn't make. I didn't get all the ones that are moving forward. Um, Did you K1, say heat closure? K one, K two, K three, and K five. So not heat closure. K four is now up on Mrs. Williams's um, report. Okay, thank yes. you. Uh, <laughs> to continue, um, Mr. Chairman, at PRC's March thirteenth uh, policy review committee meeting. PRC voted uh, three to one to recommend deletion of policy 6303. Uh, as, ev as everyone knows, policy 6303 is our heat closure policy. Uh, in addition to deleting the policy, the committee also asked that the board approve the deletion of the policy um, tonight, thus waiving the three reader process. So to put that in a motion, um, we, PRSC is moving that this full board uh, vote tonight to uh, have policy 6303 sunset and that it immediately sunset so that it is addressed prior to uh, the warm temperature starting. All right, let's do that in two separate motions. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee to waive three readers? So moved. so moved. There's no need for a second. Any discussion on that? Mrs. Causey. Um, Mr. Chair, I would just remind you that earlier in response to uh, public comment regarding policy 6303 that you said that this meeting would be following the agenda. And in fact, in the document that was uh, put online for the public to see, it does state that there will be a first reading March 21st and public comment on April 18th and third reading and a vote on May 9th. So I would say that it's not proper procedure to at this point um, without public comment to vote to move it forward. All right. You know, indeed, it was, indeed, it was uh, the first reader, but there's been a motion to waive the other readings. So Correct. This, so this motion is to waive the three-reader process. 
Mrs. Causey. Um, I would just like to say that actually I'm somewhat speechless, but you know that's not true, anyone that knows me, but I am somewhat speechless that after a year and a half of working on this issue of protecting the health and safety of our students and teachers in non-air conditioned schools that my fellow board members on the policy review committee meet, policy review committee would even move this request to the full board. And I will be equally and even more greatly disappointed that this board would vote to move this through without public comment. Just tonight, we have heard from TABCO president the board has received a petition that was put together just recently that has over uh, 200 signatures. We heard from PTA County Council tonight. We heard from, we've received emails from the PTA president of Pleasant Plains Elementary School. We've also heard public comment from um, other parents about Pleasant Plains and their severe overcrowding, which leads to even more heat accumulating in classrooms. We also heard from the Northeast Advisory Council pointing out that many of these schools that we're talking about without air conditioning are also overcrowded. We also heard public comment just tonight from Dr. Ferrone, a medical doctor who works in a hospital expressing the additional health concerns for, for students and teachers with illness or fragile health being in these non-air conditioned schools. Also, um, there were other uh, public comment given, uh, Ms. Bergman, Ms. Lily Rowe, um, Additionally, we have received other emails. The heat closure policy was developed and approved in 2016 to protect the health and safety of the students, teachers, and staff at non-air conditioned schools in Baltimore County. It effectively required the superintendent to close 37 schools for four days in August and September, when excessive heat and humidity would have adverse effects on the health, safety, of the students and teachers and the ability to provide an equitable and effective learning environment. It protected close to 13,000 students and teachers. It also protects the students' ability to carry water bottles and it gives principals the authority to move students to cooler areas of the school. At the February 12th, 2017 Policy Review Committee meeting, the administration was proposing to amend Policy 6303 to phase it out as more schools became air conditioned. Suddenly at the March 13th meeting, the administration proposed to delete the policy without public comment through three regular reading uh, through <clears throat> without the regular three meeting reader process. Uh, the administration has said that the, the policy should be deleted because it limits the superintendent. That's not the case. Policy 6303 can be amended to make that clear. And our board attorney, Andy Nussbaum, can also speak to the flexibility and the authority that the superintendent has in other situations. We can also add other statements that will protect the elementary school students. If predicted heat index of 90 degrees before 3 p.m., then only the non-AC elementary schools could be closed, thereby protecting those students because they are in school longer in the heat of the day, but allowing our high school students to be able to stay in school, receive instruction, especially related to the end of the school year, um, advanced placement testing, uh, HSA, and so forth, where they it's very important for them to be in school. All other weather scenarios or building issues, loss of power, et cetera, are under the superintendent's authority and discretion due to Rule 6303 and also Policy 8131, which is administration in policy absence. It's uh, on the um, website, and it uh, states that the superintendent can has the authority and discretion uh, to make decisions in an emergency that are not otherwise covered in policy. So if there's some other weather event that comes up that's not covered in policy, the superintendent certainly has the authority and discretion uh, to make the decisions uh, for the benefit of the safety of the students. So I would just say that the, the Board of Education cannot continue to ignore concerned students, parents, teachers, staff, families, and community members who want this rule to stay in place. It also uh, stipulates that the superintendent needs to make the call to close schools the night before so that families can plan. We have so many families where the parents are all working and to do a closure that morning of uh, midday closure or so forth is very inconvenient uh, to, to families and their situations. So I would just encourage my fellow board members to please allow this to go through the three reader process so we can hear public comment and make improvements to this policy. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Hen. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we heard tonight that over 3,000 individuals are engaged on this issue, in particular on social media. 3,000, just about the heat closure policy. To bypass the opportunity for public comment would be doing a huge disservice to those individuals who obviously care very much about this issue. So I second Ms. Causey's comment and ask that we um, maintain the three reader. Uh, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. I am stunned by this proposal, both portions of it, both the uh, deletion of the policy and the waiving of the three readers. Uh, nothing has changed that would warrant deletion of this policy just a few months after we created it. But it is a slap in the face to the thousands of stakeholders and teachers who have spoken out on this issue. Uh, obviously, we are setting aside all of the public input that we heard over months and months simply because the administration has brought forward a renewed request for, with, with, without providing any additional information or no change in circumstances. Uh, so we need to hear from the stakeholders again, obviously. So I ask that we not waive those three readers. Any other comments before I call on the vote? The vote is just on uh, waiving the three readers. Mr. Ewellfelder. Um, I'm going to support waiving the three readers. And um, it basically, it's this. It's my understanding, and if my understanding is incorrect, then I'll change my position, that the superintendent has the authority to do whatever the policy presently says. And since you said that there has been no change uh, in the past year, it would seem to me a waste of everybody's time to hear the public again reiterate what they may have said the first time around. I trust that if I am correct that the superintendent has the authority to do whatever this policy says, that he is intelligent and he's compassionate, compassionate and very knowledgeable, and he would make the right decision relative to closing a school, schools, or whatever our policy uh, anticipated uh, in the event of any type of heat problem. So that, therefore... I suggest otherwise. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate the community's input. We have listened to the community um, for a, a year now. And we created a policy um, as a result to the community input. What I've learned now as a board member, and as I'm sure most board members understand, that when we create a policy or we make a change in the system, it has a trickle, down, up, right, left effect. The superintendent, as, as um, Mr. Nussbaum has said, he has authority and he should have the autonomy to make the decision for the school system. So if he can do what the policy says or he cannot do what the policy says, why do we need a policy in place to tie his hands? Without the policy, he could uh, keep the elementary school students in school or at home and the high school and middle school stu uh, students at school. He could possibly, depending on high school hours, close uh, upper level schools early um, and, and keep afternoon activities so that they can have sports, so they can do their AP exams, so they can do uh, prom if they needed to. So I feel like this policy is redundant. We are, uh, if, we, if we move it back to PRC, that takes us back to our next PRC meeting, which I believe is four, then we have to come back for three readers, and that comes to the end of school. So if we, if we, we can take it back, and we can, take, we can do the three readers, but then that, that is, again, almost, it's not even redundant. It's, it makes this whole policy or this whole discussion a moot point, because it was going to sunset anyway, depending on how the vote went for PRC. Thank you. Mrs. Virch. I'll yield to Ms. Causey. She had her hand up before I reached for my microphone. <laughs> Mrs. Causey. I would just say to Ms. Johnson's point that there are, as I just mentioned with policy 8131, anything that's not covered by policy in an emergency, the superintendent has authority to make decisions. But I would also say that we have in front of us, and we just voted to put through the three-reader process, a number of other policies where he would have the ability to make decisions. But the board has decided that we should have policies to dictate what is important, to give the vision, to give the broad stroke of what is most important, what needs to be considered. And in that regard, I would say that's why this policy should be maintained. I agree that it can be improved 
and that's what we should focus on. And if we need to clarify, as I said, Mr. Nussbaum has the opinion that, that the superintendent does have flexibility, but if the uh, superintendent and the administration want additional language in the policy to really dictate that, to really clarify that, we can do that through the three-reader process. But we have policies o over a whole number of things for very good reason, to give the general broad goals of how we want the school system to operate and how we should have it operate. What we are legally required to do is to keep these students safe. Thank you. Um, Mr. Birch. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start off with just two brief observations. The first is that uh, my colleague has indicated how greatly disappointed she is with the board even discussing this this evening. It is worth noting in August of last year, my colleague used the same term, greatly disappointed, when this board voted eight to three for this policy to be adopted. My colleague opposed this specific policy, and I understand her passion tonight, but she did not want this policy to be in effect, and she noted what she saw as its shortcomings. Secondly, my other colleague indicated we passed this. I note the same video minutes indicate my colleague voting against and speaking ardently and passionately against this very policy that she now defends in the status quo. Now, with regard to the parents. It seems to me that this policy has been ridiculed by parents it actually sought to protect. Parents who thought it didn't protect their children and indicated to me they would keep their child home regardless if this policy existed. And notwithstanding the graphic that we've seen from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration about the heat index. Secondly, there are the parents who ridiculed this policy as being unnecessary. In fact, they said it, they, there are parents I spoke with from one of the very schools that's been mentioned tonight who said when I asked them this question, is there any temperature at which you would agree that schools should be closed? These two parents who have two children in the school that was mentioned tonight said no. These are very disparate positions, notwithstanding the graphic from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration about the heat index. Thirdly, there are the parents who ridiculed this policy as unfair because their student athletes, who they are very proud of, attend non-air conditioned schools. They said they were not able to compete because they were in the school that was not air conditioned and had been closed. Notwithstanding the graphic of the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration about heat index. Fourth, there are parents who I believe like this policy. I'm not sure how many of them there are, but if the basis for it is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration graphic, I don't know anyone who goes to that organization for any health examination, diagnosis, or treatment. Lastly, as I began my remarks, there are my two colleagues who specifically voted against this policy and now defend its status quo roots, notwithstanding the fact that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says it should actually be a different standard. So, in conclusion, however many folks out there like this policy, there is not unanimity by any means with regard to this policy. The failings have been noted. And I'm someone who supported that policy. I was one of those eight votes for it. But I have heard from parents, I have listened to what they have to say. The authority to close schools existed prior to there ever having been this policy. That authority with the superintendent will exist 
after this policy if it is voted by this board to be deleted. That then means there is a fail-safe. But I will suggest this to you. Remember the parents who, f who ridiculed it as not doing enough. It was Mike Collins who said when, when he was here on this policy on August 30th, he said, this is a huge policy for what he believed to be a small group of parents. And in fact, he suggested those parents, before this policy, would have made unilaterally the decision in their child's best interest for their child to remain home. So notwithstanding whether we have a policy, there are parents who make that decision for themselves in the best interest of their child. The board should not be substituting its judgment for the judgments of parents who make that judgment in the best interest of their child. All right, the motion on the floor is to waive the three readings, but Ms. Hen, you'll have the last comment here. Thank you. First of I all, my, I say it may be failing, but I don't see any signs to delete the heat closure policy. So the parents that are here are clearly in favor of keeping it in place, and I think that should be noted. Secondly, hearing from the public is never a waste of board time. They are the reason we are here. If we have the opportunity to hear from them again, especially if they're disparate, disparate positions, as my colleague Mr. Virch has said, then we should hear from them. That's all. All right, I think everyone's had a chance to speak on this I'd issue. I'd like to respond to what Mr. Virch said. Go ahead. You're going to, if you just speak very briefly, Ms. Causey, you speak very briefly, and then we're going to call this question. Mr. Virch has a very selective memory, and everything that he said, which indicated his confusion over mixed signals from the public, indicates that we need to hear from the public again. Also, Ms. Johnson's comments of why we should waive the three readers suggested that the impetus is to avoid having it go to the end of the year before this policy is deleted. So while she says that we should give the superintendent discretion, obviously she feels that there would be some impact by deleting this policy or not deleting the policy. So. We need those three readers, and, and I'll speak to the other part of the motion after the vote. Okay. Last comment before we call the vote on I just want to waiving the third re three readers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to clarify uh, some of Mr. Virch's comments. I voted on August 9th for the original policy 6303. And then I voted against the amended policy that was presented on August 30th. Um, again, without readers, um, because it it weakened the policy. And I had heard from a great number of parents and advocates that it was not going to be in the best interest of the children. So while I voted against it, I am in the position now of it is better for our parents to have something to count on rather than nothing because in the past while the superintendent had the authority that he has now <coughs> these children remained in schools that were too hot some of them ending up going to the hospital so i don't want someone to misconstrue how my votes affect the the students and the and the teachers in this system so that's why i'm saying this policy needs to go through the three readers so that it can be improved to protect the safety but also deal with the impacts that we have discovered have uh, are in play and also I would like to point out that I brought my binder with me that what I put together for the August 30th meeting and that I added to afterwards and these were all of the emails that we received in favor of having the policy and there were maybe three that were disappointed when it was weakened um, by this board so I just wanted to clarify that point and again uh, please uh, have my members vote to go through three readers. And so the motion on the, the motion. I'm sorry, they got a chance to respond. I apologize. All right, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. Um, I think we're all saying the same thing. We want what is best for our children. We want our children to be in a healthy, safe environment. And we have a superintendent who is able to make that call. We have a superintendent who has made the call in the past. We do not need a policy to dictate what he can and can't do, what he can and can't do, what he chooses to with the school system. We are here 
to be policy creators. We are here to protect our students. We are here to, to hear from, from our constituents, as which, which we have, have done. We have a superintendent who sits here who can protect our students, as he has done in the past five years. All right, so all those in favor of waiving the three readers, please raise your hand. Seven votes, so the motion carries. So do I have a motion to adopt the Policy Review Committee's recommendation to, to delete Policy 6303? So moved. All right, no second is uh, required. Is there any further discussion that has not already been articulated in the prior presentation? Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. In the PRC meeting, um, Michelle Prumo stated there were two reasons for the administration's request to delete this policy. One is that the superintendent already has the authority to close schools, and two is that the restricting the superintendent's discretion may impact end-of-year school activities. Uh, nothing was suggested by the administration on how to address the health and safety issues that the policy was adopted to address in the first place. The policy was necessary because the superintendent was failing to close schools when it was needed. When we passed the policy originally, it resulted in the closing of schools for two days which would not otherwise have occurred. Health and safety issues were raised by hundreds of stakeholders, if not thousands, are being cast aside in favor of a dubious justification by administration. It doesn't even make sense that they would bring this back to the board after we spent so much time considering it. Without any reason, there's been no change. So why would the board have to reconsider the same thing we've already considered. I believe the reasons for the administration's request was not what they stated, but rather that the administration wants to avoid the potential for significant school closures due to the administration's and this board's unwillingness to provide immediate portable AC relief for our students and staff. The fact that the central office is placing end of year activities above student and staff health and safety is alarming. There are currently 37 schools without AC, and I provided a list that I handed out earlier. Uh, this was provided to us at our request by the superintendent, I believe in January. And it lists another 156 schools that have air conditioning but they have non-air conditioned spaces because they're partially air conditioned or they have non-functioning air conditioning. The deletion of this policy would affect many thousands of students and staff. Two of the worst conditioned schools at our last meeting voluntarily put themselves to the end of the line for facilities and air conditioning. This change would greatly impacted these already suffering schools. Three of the four members of the PRC voted to move this deletion forward. I cannot fathom the rationale for this. Words and actions are out of alignment. That's the mark of insincerity. Board members will have to answer for their votes on this board. I find this action offensive to the hundreds of stakeholders who gave input to fight for the creation of this policy. Ms. Johnson. I didn't have my hand raised, but oh, I will. No, nope, I will sorry. actually say something. <laughs> if, there nope. wasn't I do have a comment. Miss, I'm sorry. Okay. You said Go my ahead. name, so now i got to say something. Um, so we have to also refresh everybody's memory that there are board members on, sitting up here who voted against central air conditioning for some of our, our schools on the east side, such as Stemmers Run Middle, Middle, Riv Middle River Middle, Golden Ring Middle, Arbutus Middle, Franklin Middle, which is one of my schools, and Delaney High School. So we have, I have a very difficult time sitting up here saying that, with board members sitting up here saying that uh, health and safety is of top concern when you have the, the over principle quote, principle, you decide to vote no against central air condition to hold out for portable air condition that is not happening this year. 
Mrs. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to share um, the PRC was charged with trying to determine whether or not um, additional changes could be made that would adequately accommodate the many factors and nuances uh, that was shared uh, by the community, many parents and teachers and, and others. And what PRC concluded was this heat closure policy really could not be a one size fit all. And in fact, it was actually going to be tying the superintendent's hands if, in fact, the superintendent was able to do something more creative um, and, you know, less restrictive than the policy. There was also discussion about um, testing at the end of the year and where the MAP testing would fall. And by this policy, if it was mandatory that schools were closed, then these young people would not be able to retake this test. There was discussion also about um, athletes whose parents felt that this policy was actually going to keep them from getting into college because they couldn't play their evening sports because the schools were closed. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that PRC did try to come up with some one size fit all, and it doesn't work. Because we have a superintendent who is quite capable of making these, and quite frankly, um, it was probably a bad idea to pass this policy to begin with. But because this board wanted to hear from the public and wanted to try to do something. But sometimes nothing is better than something if there is an alternative. And I just want to reflect back on Delaney when it made a decision that it would rather have nothing than a partial renovation. And really, that's what we, where we are tonight. If this policy is, a, is an attempt to be a one-size-fit-all, and it really can't be, and we have an alternative where we have a quite capable superintendent to make the right decisions, despite what may have happened in the past, he now understands this board's desire. He now understands better the community's desire. And so I am encouraging this policy to be sunset. Are there further comments before Mrs. Uh, Miss, Miss Brett? Um, I would just like to say that I do not support sunsetting this policy, um, and I, the reasons for that is, first, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of my term, I do remember there were thousands of emails, stakeholders coming out, signing policy, or signing, um, uh, telling us that they want a policy that's going to clearly outline when schools are not going to be in session. Um, that said, there's no reason why students should ever be in the building if the heat index, index is over 90 degrees. We, when creating this policy, used the NOAA study that said, or index, that basically says that over 90 degrees um, heat index is cause for extreme caution. So as you all said, we have a very intelligent superintendent, so we probably would not have school that, those days anyway. So what this policy then becomes is simply a guide, I feel, for our stakeholders. This is a promise that it's a safeguard that we will not be in unsafe conditions and it's something that stakeholders are asked ask for. And as representatives, I feel that that's something we should give them and we should keep it in place. Mrs. Hen. Um, first off, I think it's important to note that I don't think anyone around this table is questioning the superintendent's capability to make this decision. The fact of the matter is the board and the PRC had the wisdom to create this policy, to put it in place. I would like to know what's changed. There was clearly a need for this policy to be created, otherwise it wouldn't have been. What has changed that makes us believe that now we no longer need this? Clearly something wasn't working. The policy provides clear guidance as to what conditions are necessary to close schools. And by voting to keep it, we're putting the health and safety of our students first. Any other comments or questions? Mrs. Causey and then I'll defer Mr. to Mr. Verge oh, first. Mrs. Causey, go. Mrs. Causey. Um, first of all, I want to um, 
say that at the policy review committee meetings that we held where we discussed policy 6303 on multiple occasions, I made multiple uh, suggestions and motions that were not supported by my three um, fellow PRC board members around the issue of providing temporary cooling during the testing phase. If you Google temporary air conditioning, commercial air conditioning, there are thousands of things that pop up where you can rent temporary air conditioners for four to six weeks. And if there's not electrical power, you can also rent a generator. Where at these schools, we could come up with a, a plan to safeguard the children during those testing times by creating cooling spaces in each school without air conditioning so that the principals can rotate them through so that the children do not become subject to heat illness so that they can focus, so they can go to school, get the meals that they need, that the families can go to work, and that the, the students do not miss that instruction that they need. So to say that there was no opportunity or there was, there was nothing that we could do in PRC is simply not true. There are things that we could have done, including asking the staff to do this, but uh, the chief of staff said that that was just going to be too hard and I'm paraphrasing, she can identify what her own words were. But um, there were other uh, suggestions that I made to improve the policy to deal with some of these um, issues that parents brought up and that the superintendent uh, staff brought up. So there, there are still options for us to improve the policy and keep it in place. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, um, Ed. Um, less folks have the idea that somehow because the board is engaged in a vigorous debate or discussion that somehow we're not still colleagues on a board. Um, I've mentioned the passion of my colleagues on this issue. We have all heard and I think in many cases have felt um, the passion of the parents um, throughout our system who communicated with us whatever may have been their position. Um, at the PRC, um, I note at the last meeting, uh, the agenda was moving and we came to this specific policy. And my colleague, um, uh, Ms. Causey, had not yet arrived. We all sometimes are running a little late. And I said to our chair, um, uh, Romaine, I said, we have a board member for whom this is a policy of particular interest. Might we delay Except or hold I up? saw her. Yeah, and, <laughs> and with in. that, and Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen did exactly. come in. And I have no doubt that Kathleen would have done the same thing for a policy that I had a particular interest in. And where I go with this is that I think when this vote was, was originally, or, or was secondly taken in August, that it was a sincere effort. It was well intention. And it's my sense that some of the passion may spill over into the words, but please don't think that there is any less respect for the folks who are, who are colleagues here. And after tonight, there will be other board meetings. And I know that as I go around to schools and to communities, just as you do, you will hear from the constituencies and the stakeholders. And with that, I'll, that's, that's the end of my remarks, Mr. Chairman. Does anyone who has not yet spoken want to speak. I just Ms. want to Deaton. say thank you. Um, I am conflicted and I'm not sure which way I'm going to vote. I thought I was sure when I got here and then listening I'm really not sure now because I do understand both sides of the issue. I don't want students to suffer but I remember last year when we passed the um, policy we heard from many parents that they want their kids in school. Uh, we want our children to play sports and for all the reasons that um, Romaine and Steve said. So at this point right now, I don't know which way I'm going to vote until he calls how you going to vote. <laughs> well, it's time for the vote. So I'm going to ask all those who are in favor of deleting policy 6303 to please raise your hand. The motion carries. Next on our agenda is comments from board members. I'll start with Mr. Stewart. I'll, I'll leave to others to continue the discussion there. But I, I will say that I appreciate the comments from the Lansdowne community tonight. I will also say that in the audience were members of 
the PTSA who were there, including the President, uh, Cindy Adams, and I want to thank them for being here. I think that this board will be uh, interested in what they have to say. I certainly am myself and look forward to hearing from them when they get a chance to speak. Uh, with that, I'll pass it along. Ms. Eaton. Uh, Ms. Jackie Brewster stated earlier that she was disappointed with my comments about the renovation of Patapsico High School. But I did state that I wished it would take into consideration the overcrowdedness of the school. But I didn't want to stop the renovation. I did speak to the principal. We had a long discussion. He is happy with the renovations that are going on. I don't have a magic wand. I don't have a bank account to give money. If I did, I probably wouldn't. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I do wish we could get more money from the county to address all these problems, because Patapsco is not the only school that needs to be rebuilt. That's all. Ms. Williams. I have nothing to Ms. Causey. Um, I have many things to say. Uh, I'm going to start with, I would like to make a motion that we direct Mr. Kevin Smith and his team to bring to the next Building and Contracts Committee information on costs and how we could utilize commercial rental equipment to create cooling areas in non-AC schools. There are commercial industrial rental equipment that is available, including generators for schools that are said that they do not have electrical capacity that could be rented for four to six weeks during the testing window. We have PARC, final exams, HSA, advanced placement, and international baccalaureate testing, as well as uh, other things that are going on at the end of the year. So that a cafeteria, a gym, and maybe some classrooms could be cooled so these students could spend time in the cool areas so they can come to school, eat, stay on track with instruction and testing. I'll second that motion. You make a motion uh, comments. First of all, this is this, this is, is board comment time. time. I um, was gonna make it right after the vote, but you moved it along, so um, uh, and I think it's probably best for something like that to first be discussed with the superintendent about the time it takes for somebody to, to tackle that task and whether or not there is time on the administration to tackle that task, especially on the short order timeline that you, uh, you suggested. Um, I would recommend that we talk to the superintendent and his staff and not make it in the form of a motion. I would vote against it. Any, um, any other discussion on the motion? Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor of the motion, please uh, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the motion study. fails. Five votes. Any further any further comments, Mrs. Causey? Yes, I just want to tell the community that um, you really need to let your voices be heard. And um, the other thing I'm going to say is really what's happening is there's an oligarchy of power in Baltimore County and it's not the 12 members sitting around this Board of Education. I want to say that uh, I got that term from uh, an author, Mr. John Stokes, who described a similar situation in his book, Students on Strike, where he tells his story as a student in Virginia in segregated uh, times where he and his students left his school, went on strike literally over facilities. And it became a part of that tremendous Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court that ended separal, separate but equal. There have been questions of whether the county executive wants to influence the Board of Ed, and it's not a question of if, it's, but rather it's a question of how much control does he have. It really is the county executive and his inner circle and the superintendent with the administration and some members of the Board of Education that were initially appointed during Governor O'Malley at the request of uh, the county executive. <laughs> and what I need to say is that that is not the way this board is supposed to operate. This board is supposed to set the vision, to set the goals, to set the priorities, and we are not doing our job. And um, it has been said, this is not just me speaking, it's been said by former board member Senator Collins that all construction funding decisions have been made by the county. Well, that's not, that's not the only ones. And I think that we need to really aggressively move forward with a strategic facilities plan that allows community input and a clear prioritization of what is important to get done, which includes the health and safety. We heard tonight 
from numerous stakeholders about facilities. Overcrowding, overcrowding um, that's not being addressed. We have an elementary school going in, and if there had been strategic planning, it might have been larger to accommodate more students. So the community has the influence to change this by engaging their board member and their county council representative. One can look at the success, and I call it a success, of Delaney and Lansdowne to avoid their inadequate renovation contracts and ask the Board of Ed and the county to reevaluate their facilities. Additionally, right now, the budget for the school system is working its way through the county. If you have questions or concerns, right now is the time to get involved. Additionally, I just wanted to comment on the newspaper article uh, in the Sun, Bridging the Divide, uh, which I also want to concur with former board member Senator Collins, who was quoted that Dr. Dance did not bring this up with the board in a meaningful way, and that if he did, he would not have been uh, fired by the board. But in fact, he might have discovered that there are board members who experienced that sort of integration in their own public school experience, like me. And, would want to engage in conversation about what is the best way that we can um, improve the communities and the schools in, in our county and throughout the county. And that's exactly a community issue that could be discussed as part of a 10-year strategic plan, not a philosophy to try and insert now and then into communities during redistricting of small areas of the county. Uh, we also have concerns about the grading procedures that we're still hearing. I was glad to hear in the dinner that we had with our advisory council folks, and I really want to um, thank the advisory council folks for the work that they do with their communities and trying to bring that input to us, those suggestions and the support for the school system. And so I was glad to hear that the high schoolers' concerns around the report cards are going to be addressed and that there's going to be notation on there that uh, these students are currently being affected by a new grading pilot, um, another experiment that they're being involved in in the school system. Um, also, we're still waiting to hear about bus transportation issues. We asked back in um, August and September for an update, but the superintendent and staff say they will not provide the update until the May meeting. Um, and lastly, I'm just disappointed about policy 6303, and um, I hope that when the hot weather comes, um, that this administration will do something, number one, to put cooling areas in in these schools, and I will be bringing that up again, um, and that we do what's right to protect the students and the teachers. Mr. Yulfader. Yes, I, I did want to comment on a Sun Paper article. I know the uh, readership of the Sun Paper has diminished greatly over the years, so many of you may not have seen the article. It's one of four. I thought it was an excellent article. Uh, however, I'm going to reserve judgment uh, until I see the other three. Um, one thing I, I did want to point out in our discussion is that every time uh, the comments are made that perhaps we are not uh, uh, protecting the health and welfare uh, of our students, I think we are making uh, a disservice uh, to the superintendent. I think the superintendent is just as concerned about every single student in our system as much as any one of us are. So I think that the superintendent will do the right thing for the most students and will accommodate where it has to be. And so I think it's just wrong to say that we are not protecting, that the superintendent's job is to protect, and I'm sure that he will do it. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Um, I want to thank the Area Advisory Councils for joining us for, at dinner tonight, specifically the Northwest Area Advisory Council. I got to meet some of the new members, and that was um, very enjoyable. I visited Lansdowne um, High School last week, and it was because of a persistent and passionate PTA president. And um, I was there, and we had a good conversation with the PTA members, with the principal, and we gave a lot of credit, and they were very thankful to the, to the motion that Nick passed here. And I wanted to say that Mr. Miller was still there. I think it was 8 o'clock, and we walked around, and he introduced me to a, an electric, electrical teacher named Mr. Carroll, who was still there at 8 p.m., um, filling out some paperwork so his, his students can get another certificate. So it was very impressive. Um, I want to thank the board for moving forward with the magnet assess assessment program. You know, in the wording it says to reduce minority isolation, which in other words means segregation, which in other words means we still have segregation in our school system. 
So if you do see the Sun article, to say that Dr. Dance has not addressed segre segregation, race, inequities, education gaps um, is completely false. I've been on the board for three years. I, my children are in a school where they are, there are probably two other black children in their class, maybe 15 total. This county is still segregated. I mean, we have done a very good, a diligent job of addressing race, uh, saying words like inequality, saying words like segregation and race. We have a magnet program that's now spread throughout the entire county, so there's access to students. We have uh, BCPS1, which allows parents to have equal access. We have a partnership with Comcast that allows additional access if you can't afford um, internet service. We have a grading and reporting policy that it creates a universal platform for all teachers to grade the same way. It is, a, it is new and it is being worked out and it is, it is on its way to perfection. So we also have um, the STAT, which allows students to have small group individualized learning um, and has allowed my, my children to, to flourish. And this is the kind of county that I want to be in for my, for my students. So I thank the county, I thank, I, I thank everybody in the, who has gone through and has, has allowed me to have courageous conversations. Um, because if, if it wasn't for this county, I don't know that I'd even be having these sort of courageous conversations. So I thank the superintendent. To hear words tonight, like, uh, what, did, what did someone say? Um, shoot, they said, uh, just to do his job, to, to get up and something, some, it was the disrespect that this black superintendent sees and, and I hear is, re is astounding. And to, be, to have only one other woman of color on this board and three total for a county that is, rep that is now majority people of color does show that there is segregation, but also shows that this county is making strides unlike any other county that I, ha that I have ever seen. I, I pride myself in being a board member. I go to trainings. We're going to a training coming up. I talk to board members who, who have uh, a jurisdiction of eight high schools. That's their entire jurisdiction. We, have, we are the 25th largest school system in the country. The changes that we make, like I said earlier, they affect everyone. They, they trickle up, down, left, and right. So. We have to continue to be diligent and have these conversations and know that there are disparities, that there are disparities that many of us maybe have never even experienced or seen, but they're out there. So I, again, I thank the administration, I thank the chiefs, I thank all staff members, I thank teachers and administration have gone through Beyond Diversity because we have a lot of work to do, but with the right board members and the right board, we can get this work done. Thank you. Ms. Brett. Um, I would just like to echo um, some of the other board members. Um, I would like to thank the Area Advisory Committees for joining us today for dinner. I always enjoy um, having more people around the table. Um, and for board members, I know most of us are going, or most of you all are going to um, the conference, but we will be having our student member of the board forum this Friday. Um, and then after that, we will be announcing our nominee. So exciting stuff along the way. Mr. Birch. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. Um, as Marisol mentioned with regard to the MSAP grant and was mentioned by staff, the $15 million over five years, and I referenced three of the schools that are in our sixth district, Overly High School, Golden Ring uh, Middle School, Middle River Middle School, uh, magnet programs at those schools are significant enhancements to education for our students. Secondly, I note uh, the significant number of contracts uh, that relate to the new Northeast Elementary School that were approved unanimously uh, by this board, uh, where uh, the original approval of affordability began in the system. It found its way to this board, and the board unanimously approved that. Uh, I note that in Perry Hall, the Perry Hall Elementary School is 41 percent over capacity. In fact, it has more students over capacity than Perry Hall Middle School. It has nine relocatables. 
Gary Hall Middle School has three. Not that we should boast or that any student is more important than others, but Vincent Farm Elementary School is 30% over capacity. Chapel Hill is 27%, and Joppa View Elementary, the school nearest to where Barbara and I live, is 24. And we can go through the other schools that are over, but these are significant, um, uh, these are schools with significant overcrowding. The vote tonight is another step to build that school. But as the superintendent has said over a long period of time, one new elementary school in that area will not be enough. And there are other areas where one new school for elementary school overcrowding may or may not be enough, where additions for middle schools uh, may or may not be enough. But the work of the board was ongoing before we came on this board, and it will be ongoing after other folks sit in these seats. We do the best that we can with a well-intentioned eye for the future and a lot of respect for the people who teach the children in our school system every day, whether the school is air-conditioned or not. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly say that I uh, am disappointed that I missed the discussion and vote last uh, meeting regarding the renovations to the high schools. Uh, for the record, I did want to say that I would have supported the majority of the board members that did vote in not moving ahead the Delaney High School renovation because of the overwhelming uh, comments that I got from people in that community specifically. Um, they seem to be uh, pretty consistent in their position. And I would have taken the same vote as the majority of the uh, board. However, I do want to say that I personally have some very deep concerns about um, bypassing a 30 to $40 million renovation on these schools. Um, I guess having gone through economic cycles as I have, I just feel that we are one recession away from losing a lot of funds or the potential for funds. And uh, just this evening, we heard uh, the plea for at least three new high schools in Baltimore County that will cost over $100 million. And in the near term, I just have concerns about whether uh, which high schools may or may not uh, be fortunate enough to get that kind of funding, at least in the foreseeable future that I see. So um, I do think that the decisions of the board have, have to be practical and tied with physical realities. and. Um, in this case, I particularly hope my perspective is absolutely wrong, that um, as Ms. Bergman said this evening, and maybe Mr. Prumo intimated, that there's some out-of-the-box kind of thinking that could come up with uh, the kind of funds it would take to build three new high schools. Um, but my mind just does not see those as practical paths that we would, uh, we would achieve. So I think, you know, again, my personal thought is that I would have uh, uh, tried to encourage uh, the renovations that were have approved, the money was there, just because that's just my perspective. And lastly, I would just like to say that um, I sometimes get personally offended when um, it's implied that my decisions are not my own, that I'm being influenced by somebody else. I only serve on the board for the students of Baltimore County. I have no other motivation. I have no other political uh, affiliations or motivations. And maybe it wasn't intended that way, but I make my decisions based on what I think is best for the students of Baltimore County. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. It's time that the public demands accountability from our school system, both from the superintendent and from this board. Uh, the superintendent has been at the helm now for five years, and so uh, we can hold him accountable for the results at this point. Board members need to be pressed to answer to their votes. It would be reasonable and helpful if the board's body of work, our votes, were posted online in an easy-to-read spreadsheet by member. There are other uh, school systems that do that. You can go on their website and see it. The board has previously voted against my motion to do so, and the need for it is becoming more evident over time. Thank you. I'm Mrs. Hen. Thank you. I've had the pleasure of touring several high schools over the past two weeks, and I just want to thank Lansdowne, Delaney, Patapsco, Parkville, and Perry Hall High Schools for their hospitality. I look forward to visiting many more in the weeks remaining this school year. 
While all of these visits were truly wonderful, one visit really stood out. Last week I had the pleasure of visiting Eastern Technical High School and touring their incredible new maker space with Mrs. Michelle Anderson. I would strongly encourage my colleagues on the board to get out to Eastern to check it out. I plan on returning to see it in action and I can't wait to see what the students build in their new space. While the makerspace itself is remarkable, what impressed me even more is Eastern Tech's commitment to developing student leaders who bring innovative approaches to solving real world problems. These students are going to graduate thoroughly prepared with the skills, knowledge, and experience needed to bring about the types of systemic changes needed to improve the quality of life in their communities. The can-do culture at Eastern Tech is palpable. I have the feeling that students at Eastern don't hear things like, that's not possible, or this is the way it's always been done. Rather, it is evident that student ideas can flourish through the school's investment in innovative teaching and learning spaces. There's a lot that we as a board can learn from these students at Eastern and how they have modeled through its own practices true innovative leadership. It's time that we challenge all of our practices and fundamental assumptions and throw out the excuse of that's the way we've always done it. And, fun, and we must do better. We can and must do better. It's time to think creatively and prudently to maximize limited resources for optimum benefit for all of our students. And it's time to think strategically and move beyond just-in-time management, particularly for school construction needs. We know what our long-term needs are. We need long-term plans to address them. I want to thank my colleagues on the board for approving contracts for the construction of the new Northeast Elementary School tonight. As we heard from the Northeast Advisory, the need for elementary seats in the area is tremendous and urgent, and this construction could not be delayed. However, if I could turn back time a year or two, I would have implored the board to consider all of the needs in the Northeast and to look at comprehensive solutions to maximize the investment in the two planned elementary construction projects. Could those schools have been expanded to include sixth grade in order to relieve the dire overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle? What would the savings have been to taxpayers to expand those projects over constructing an entire new school? Perhaps it wouldn't have been a viable option, but the board has a fiscal responsibility to consider alternatives and to look at needs of the system holistically and invest wisely. Let's look to the students of Eastern and students countywide for inspiration. There may be a shortage of dollars, but there's no shortage of ideas, and those are our most valuable asset. Thank you, Mrs. Hen. Uh, three, three quick points. Uh, number one, I want to thank the board for a, a, a robust discussion this evening. I, I think all the members of the board should be complimented on uh, their concern for uh, uh, our system, our students, uh, and, um, and I thank you again. Number two, I want to once again uh, congratulate Sandra Reed, uh, Maryland High School Principal of the Year. What a great honor. And uh, third, I said it last week, but but uh, Mr. McDaniels was not here. Uh, we all uh, know that Mr. McDaniels not only is an active and an important member of our board, but he's also the president-elect of the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. And he has just uh, accepted the additional duty of being the chairman of the Ad Hoc Committee on Equity. And I thank you uh, for your service to the entire state of Maryland, Mr. McDaniels. There are several items uh, of information um, in your materials, including revised superintendent's rules, a financial report for January 2016 and 2017, the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council minutes of January 17. I remind you all that spring break is April 10 through 17 and that our next board meeting is April 18. We're adjourned. <laughs>